This is the land of Havilah, Job 2. Job lost his children and possessions in chapter 1, all of it suddenly and spectacularly, but he did not renounce God. Now, verse 1. Again, on the day when God's sons came to present themselves before Yahweh, Satan came also among them to present himself before Yahweh. Yahweh said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered Yahweh and said, From going back and forth in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Yahweh said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him in the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and turns away from evil. He still maintains his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Satan answered Yahweh and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he'll give for his life. Comment. The skin for skin wording is a literal translation of the Hebrew. The meaning is unclear, but Satan seems to be saying, No wonder he didn't renounce you. You're still protecting his person, but he will renounce you if you let me at him. Satan goes on speaking to Yahweh, verse 5. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will renounce you to your face. Yahweh said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand. Only spare his life. Comment in verse 5, Satan told God to stretch out his hand and touch Job's flesh. In the next verse, God did not touch Job, but he gave Satan permission to touch him, anything but kill him. Quote, he's in your hand, end quote. Therefore, coming up, Satan will afflict Job with the most grievous condition he can think of. Verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh and struck Job with painful sores from the sole of his foot to his head. He took for himself a potsherd to scrape himself with, and he sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still maintain your integrity? Renounce God and die. Comment. Verse 9 is one of only three verses in the book that mention Job's wife. She says nothing else other than what she just said, quote, Do you still maintain your integrity? Renounce God and die, end quote. Also translated, curse God and die. Job's response, verse 10. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job didn't sin with his lips. Comment, so far so good for Job that in all his misery he hasn't said anything negative about God. To a statement about his wife that she would have him accept good from God but not evil, he equates that to a rejection of God. He has a bedrock belief that no matter what, he shouldn't renounce God. He won't go there. He'll go on in the book to put forth his case strongly to God and question God to no end and be very put out with him, from which he'll repent at the end of the book. But God bless him, he'll never cross the line into cursing or abandoning God. He'll hold on to God by a thread for 40 more chapters. Now, other than Job, there'll be four more main characters. Three of them will make their entrance now verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come on him, they each came from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, and they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and to comfort him. When they lifted up their eyes from a distance and didn't recognize him, they raised their voices and wept, and they each tore his robe and sprinkled dust on their heads toward the sky. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Comment. That's the end of chapter 2. In verse 13, no one said anything for seven days. The four of them sat on the ground in silence. They know there are no words, but later, after Job speaks, they can't help but rebut him. The root word behind Job's name means hated or persecuted, which makes sense because Satan hated him and persecuted him. But the roots behind the names of his three friends in verse 11 are all either obscure or not particularly illustrative. It'll turn out in the rest of the book that Eliphaz is the most talkative of the friends. He'll deliver three speeches over five chapters, Bildad three speeches over three chapters, and Zophar two speeches over two chapters. Job will say the most. He'll make an opening statement to his friends in chapter 3 coming up, and he'll give a response to each of their speeches, which will be eight responses to their eight speeches. Just so we know up front whose statements we can trust, 
At the end of the book, God will pass judgment on Job's statements that he multiplied words without knowledge. In other words, that he didn't know what he was talking about. And Yahweh will pass worse judgment on what Job's three friends say. So neither Job nor his friends are reliable. That begs the question, why read the book? It's because Job and his three friends frame the questions we all ask about suffering and why God allows it. And at the end of the book, which will be chapters 31 to 42, Job and his friends don't speak much anymore, and we'll get enough answers from a man named Elihu and from Yahweh himself to make us very happy we read the questions as Job and his friends present them. Chapter 3 is next.